Josh Walsh, president of Film Independent. Welcome to Film Independent Presents. Very excited today to be talking with the filmmakers of Descendants. And um, before we dive right in, I wanna thank uh, the HFPA and Vision Media for their support of Film Independent Presents year round. Um, thank you so much. And thanks also to Netflix for making today's event possible. With that, it is really a huge pleasure and honor to introduce the director of Descendant, Margaret Brown. Hey, Josh and the producers of this incredible film, Curtin and Essie Chambers. Kyle and Essie, thanks so much for being here. Oh, our pleasure, thank you yeah, for having thanks us. Thanks for having us, yeah. So I feel so fortunate to have just watched this film. Um, oh my God, it is amazing. Uh, it's so beautiful and I, I honestly didn't know, you know, I'd heard great things about it, but I had no idea what to expect. And the experience of watching it is really extraordinary. I mean, Margaret, I all your films but this one I feel is so I mean it's gorgeous it's moving it's infuriating it's um uh, well I, 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 I'll, I'll get into the questions as opposed to describing my my emotional reaction to watching it but um to start let me ask I'm curious when you started work on this and and when the idea of the project came to you um so in was it 20, I think it was 2018, they thought, do you guys remember 2018? They, they, there was, they thought they found the ship and, um, and there was all these, a flurry of articles um, and people started sending me emails and text messages and messages on social media saying, have you seen these articles? Cause um, Order of Myths, a film I made in 20, 2005, it came out. Um, was it was about segregated Mardi Gras in Mobile where I grew up and it actually was focused around the Clotilda. Um, Helen Mayer, who's in this film, her family, she was the queen of Mardi Gras in 2000. Oh no, wait, I got the year wrong. It was 2007. Oh my God. I was going back another movie. Um, it was 2007. And, um, and so she was the white Mardi Gras queen that year. And Stephanie Lucas, whose family was descended from the Clotilda, was brought over on the Clotilda, was the black Mardi Gras queen. And we knew, I knew um, that it was sort of a whisper campaign. People would say like, oh, that the mayor family, like they brought, they, they brought the last slave ship over. But it was something that people didn't really talk about. It was like a whisper kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But then we were filming with Stephanie Lucas and her grandfather sort of just matter of factly said that his family was descended off the ship. And then the film became order of myths became kind of centered around that. And, um, and so that was the reason everyone was sending me all the articles and saying, are you going to make a follow up? Are you And I was just, I, at the beginning, I was like, no, I, I you know, um, and then I was having breakfast with one of the producers of this film, Lewis black, he was an associate producer, but the reason, you know, he kind of got that credit was because he um, was like, Margaret, we were having breakfast in LA and he was like, are you crazy? Like, you've got to go, go, just like see what's there, see if there's a story. And he like literally handed me a check and told me to get on a plane. And I did. And, um, you know, one thing I realized and people had been saying this, who'd been emailing me was it wasn't, it wasn't about the ship. It was about the community. So in a way it never even mattered to me if they did find the ship, because I knew there was a story in the community regardless. So, this, so awareness, like you grew up in Mobile, so this was something you knew about from when you were a kid? About no. Oh, really? It wasn't? No, no, I didn't, I didn't, no, I didn't learn about it in school. People didn't talk about it. Um, it was kind of like, I mean, I'm sure like the Mayer family knew about it, but it wasn't, it was I, like, again, my mother, I think it was my mother that told me, you know, when I said I was going to start making this movie, the order of myths, she sort of said to me, well, you know, that family is supposed to have brought, the it was like, she said it like almost like it was a rumor or something. It, I mean, I really do think it took finding the ship for like white people to be like, oh, there's a ship. Wow, amazing. Um, so wait, so that was in 2018, but when did you, so when did you start working on the film? Was 2018. It like in 2018, okay. Mm -hmm. And when, when was the bulk of production happening? How, how long were you shooting? We were shooting up until November of um, this year. Okay. 2021. 2021. Oh, sorry. 2021. 
Um, and can you, so you, I know you grew up in Mobile, but can you talk about your, sort of the experience of filming in the community in Africatown and, and sort of what was, what was production like? I'm assuming you had a small uh, crew, but what was, what was that process like? Um, yeah, I mean, I, we, we sort of, it's sort of like a bit of a traveling circus. Like I, I kind of work with the same people over and over. Um, and yeah, we, we kind of, um, uh, I guess like there was a lot of press kind of coming in and out, but like, um, we, we pretty much camped out there. I mean, it was cool because like I could stay with my parents and shoot and, um, a lot of our crew was from new Orleans. So it was easy for them to get over there. Um, so, I mean, Kyle and Essie were in New York, but, um, I mean, maybe they could talk about the shoots more than me. Kyle, do you want to take that one? And I, uh, Kyle, it's also, if you could just talk, I'm curious, Kyle and Essie, how, how you, when, when you guys got involved in the project and um, sort of your role through it. Yeah, you want to, you go ahead, Essie. Um, I actually came to the project a little bit later. Uh, Mar I'm also a writer in addition to being a producer and Margaret and I were in an artist residency together. And so, um, you know, we became friends and, and we were, we'd been talking about, we'd been, I'd been talking to her about the project and kind of like sort of unofficially advising her. Um, and and at, at a certain point she said, you have to meet Kyle, you have to come, we'd love for you to come on board as a producer. Um, and, you know, the timing was great. This was, this was actually before, Margaret said that you know there was a there was a false finding of the ship, um, and I came on board before the actual finding of the ship, and also um, only thought that the search for the ship would ever be a frame. That wasn't that wasn't our focus. It was the thing to wrap the story around, and so it was an incredible moment of time when you know our consciousness was shifting. There was the 1619 project and all of these other bigger conversations that we were joining that were about how we think about black history inside of, you know, American history and how, how, how we kind of recenter that thinking. And so it was just, it was, it was like the sort of the perfect moment to join the, 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 the team and the telling of the story. So yeah, I think that was the, maybe the spring of 2019. Okay. So I know the, the, um, the Zora Neale Kirsten book, uh, Barakun came out in 2018 as well. And I'm wondering, was that something did that, it, I'm sure you were obviously aware of that when the, when the book came out, but was that, when did that become part of the film for sort of the way that's woven into it? That was, I mean, I wanted to do that from the beginning. Um, um, we missed Kyle's answer, but, um, but no, we'll sorry, go, go ahead, keep going. <laughs> um, but uh, it, yeah, I mean, I, I, I read Barracoon, but then I also read the letters of, of Zora Neale Hurston and the letters really, made her come alive for me. I mean, I love Barracoon and I knew I wanted that text to sort of be a, a huge part of the film, but her, her, there was something in her letters about like, I sort of, she became really alive for me as a person and I got really obsessed with her. So, um, and, and it, it, it sort of helped me figure out like how to use Barracoon in a way, it's like reading who she, cause her, 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 her voice was so strong in the letters. One of the things I love about the film is you have, there's archival material in the film, there's film and, and photos, but they are never just presented as in a traditional, you know, way. It's, it's generally, you see people who live in the community today interacting with those texts and images. You see people reading from Barracoon or looking at the images and it makes it, I, I, it, it creates a sense of time in the film that I think is really extraordinary. Um, and I have to say, I did not know that this is sharing my ignorance. I didn't know that Zora Neale person was a filmmaker and the footage. I don't think many people do. Of Cujo just is like an electrifying moment in the film. I know. When that clip plays, I just, again, my, like my reaction in that moment was like, I, I could not believe that he lived in a moment when there was a moving picture and to see right. him looking in the lens is just like oh my god like the sense yeah. of time is suddenly compressed in a really powerful way i mean yeah you're it, it, it's sort of like when those shiver things you're like wow i mean it, the way you think about history is that being a long time ago is not a long time ago yeah exactly and also just the parallels of, of you know barracoon couldn't be um you know 
published until 2018 because you know they they she wanted to publish it in dialect and 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 at the time that that's not what they wanted so the idea it was kind of another layer of a denial of a history and so um you know there there's that in common there's there's Zora Neale and then there's Dr Kern Jackson who is kind of like our mod, modern day Zora and, and and the line that we're drawing between the two of them and so it was just yeah I mean Margaret from the very beginning, this was going to be the poetic kind of glue for the for the story. I, I also thought, I mean, this is on the same same theme that you create this sense of time by right in, in a lot of ways. The filming it, it's very simple. Like you're in the, you're you're in the contemporary world, filming real people just going about their lives, walking down the street, being in a cemetery, and talking. But just through those images you create a sense of time and history that is so uh, powerful, right? I mean, it's like the sense of history of that community and space and people grappling with what happened to it, people not knowing and, and talking about, you know, what they know, what they believe, what they think. It just brings, I, I can't think of another film that does that in that way. I, I think, I mean, I don't know what Kyle or Essie would say this, but I mean, I feel like it's because it's there. It's not because I'm putting it there. It's because it's literally there. Like they're on historic ground. Like mm -hmm. everything they're doing is suffused with the past. And, you know, I, so I don't think, I, I mean, I, I'm glad you feel that way. And, and I, I take the compliment, but I also think it's because of what it is that it seems that way. It, there's a lot of just serendipity, I think with this project. I mean, it, it touches on the Barracoon thing where I think, you know, the the biggest partner of this movie is the community in Africatown and all those people and we couldn't this this we couldn't make this movie the movie is not you know this this is their story and it couldn't be told without them without their participation and I think just a confluence of Barracoon and the finding of the ship it was it was like wait a minute there is this history here and it, it, is it a coincidence that Barracoon is coming out now it's like maybe now is our time to like step forward and tell our story and I think there was like a real lightning rod where everyone just sort of coalesced around this moment. Um, and, and we were sort of lucky enough uh, to kind of be a, part, a participant in it. Um, but it really adds this whole sort of um, just qualitative experience, that glue that I think you're talking about with, with place and time, it really kind of ties it all together. One of the most vivid parts of the film for me was the, the, the focus on community activism, right? That these people in the community are active and they're, they're coming together, they're having meetings, they're figuring out what they're gonna do. They're saying, oh, we, we're gonna write a constitution or you know, let's look at, that, at you know, how that company got to own the land. Let's like do a deep dive on that. It's really, um, but those scenes are just like wonderful and like full of energy. And again, it's like, it's, a, it's driven by that sense of history that the place has, but it's, it's, was that something that surprised you or was unexpected when you got into the film or? Um. I don't know if either of you want to take that, but I have something to say about that. Go for it. Go okay. Well, I mean, when I started, um, I, I was very taken by like, we'd go to all these meetings to kind of start the film and just take the pulse of what was going on. And it was kind of incredible that there were all these activist groups. I was just like, what? Like, this is not a huge community, but there's like a meeting about everything, about the environment, about, about the, um, there's going to be like, a, I don't know if it, what you guys saw today, there, this is on the cut that you saw, but there's, there's going to be a website at the end. And, and, you know, there's so, there's so many, you'll get a chance to like see all the groups that are, 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 are active in Africa town. It's like, and, and we couldn't even fit them all in. It's like astonishing, you know, um, the level of activism in the community to protect the community, um, you know, protect the land, to protect um, the environment, like the, the school there has a very active um, alumni association. And, and I think like, we were like, oh my God, like, I mean, I grew up in Mobile and like, I, you know, I did go to some activist stuff growing up, but like, there's like people in their eighties going to a meeting twice a day. I was, was incredible. And it also, I mean, it's this activism as part of their history, and it goes, especially within the churches, it goes all the way back to the, 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 the original church in, in Africatown. So it's, 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 it's just, it's, it's tradition, it's a part of their history. Um, yeah. So, I mean, how, how many, there, there, there are, we follow four or five in the film, but yeah, there's, yeah, there's Margaret's point, there's so, there, there are more than that even. 
Um, there were a number of scenes that really um, popped out at me that I, a couple I wanted to mention. There's one, I think it's at the scene, it's, it's a community gathering. Maybe it's where they're, they're sort of, um, the ship has been found and there, there's, there's like sort of a celebration around, but you talk to this woman, somewhat older woman and her daughter. And the, it's the older woman who says, it's, it's like this cycle and we've returned to the beginning. And then the, she walks away and there, it's just an incredible moment where the daughter takes this sigh. And then she <laughs> has, it, it's like, she clearly has a different take on it or she, she sees her mother's view, but then she says this beautiful thing. She says, I don't want to be a part of it. I want to be it which I thought was like, that, and you let that moment play out and it was just like incredible. Like you see the, the full impact of this moment for yeah. people who live there. No, I mean, when she said it, I knew it would be in the movie because I felt it in that moment. Like, you know, I mean, Vita's like, Vita's like, um, she's an amazing woman and, you know, you see her develop through the film. Um, and I don't know, I, yeah, she's, she, I feel like the way she sees things really mirrors like how I saw things, you know? And so, um, yeah, I was, I always, I always wanted to ask Vito whenever she was at something, I would always get her to, you know, and, and also um, one thing I'm, I don't want to hog the conversation too much, but like a lot of the filmmaking was, you know, me having coffee with people, like when we weren't even filming and talking about things and, um, it wasn't all in front of the camera. It was, um, it was like, you know, a lot of times in, in films I've, this was like a real, like, I really, really, really wanted to know like how they felt about everything and how they're being portrayed and, and what they thought was important. And um, I just, yeah, it was, I would say like so much time was just spent coffees and drinks and meals and for years. And that stuff, I think, is what it really paid. like that kind of off screen work is the kind of thing that develops trust with Vita so that when she's in front of the camera, she feels comfortable just saying what she thinks and not sugarcoating it or not doing a song and dance because the camera's rolling. And we just got it's just like really, really lucky uh, to, to find people that were like willing to be just candid with us about that and just, just sort of genuine. Vulnerable. Yeah. Yeah. I, I found myself wondering about that. Uh, as I was watching, because there are there are scenes like that where it's one person, but you also have these group scenes, like in you know they're in like a big conference room, and you, you, the camera you're really like a moving around, catching snippets of conversation where people still feel very unguarded and talking to each other about you know their their ancestors and uh, um, in, in just being very seemingly very relaxed on camera. Um, oh no! Did Kyle have to go to the meeting? He did he did. Okay. Well, I mean, I can speak to that. Like I, um, Kyle is taking care of a last minute problem. We're still fixing things. Um, so, uh, yeah, like, I mean, I do think we were always kind of there filming. So I do think that people were very used to our cameras being part of, um, being part of the wallpaper, you know, and also like in some of these meetings, there's a ton of press there. So like there's cameras everywhere. So I think that those two factors. Yeah, I mean, I, it's it's one of the first things that I noticed when I joined is that, um, you know, there were these hot there were these hot flashes where the, the whole the press would come in, you know, when the ship was almost found, you know, all these different moments. And what people said is, you know, people come in and out, but Margaret keeps coming, and I think that was reflected in those mo in, in the kind of community meetings where, where you know, we did become flies on the wall because we kept coming, mm -hmm. and and stayed. I guess. Yeah, and like they they know they know our crew. Like like they you know, we're all talking, we're all having meals together when we're not shooting, you know, not always, but like it, it was very everyone knew everyone. I wanted to ask also, <laughs> excuse me, about there's a great scene, it's the scene on the boat when they go out to where the the wreck was found. And um I'm sorry, I am terrible with names, I don't remember the people's names. Um, but you, it's the scene where the older white guy's talking about his ancestor who was like, had a good character. And then the other man says, well, good master, bad master, it's, you know, not, not good either way. And that scene was like, again, it was like, it's, it's not like a conflictual or confrontational scene, but there's clearly conflict there. And like, yeah. but the way everybody's speaking very openly on camera as you're there. 
I'm just curious what that what that was like in terms of capturing that moment. I mean, we were both there. Um, I mean, again, like when you see a moment like that, it's like to me. I mean, Essie definitely should speak to this too. But I mean, it's I think it's a moment that um, I've seen so many moments like that in my life. You know, where some uh, someone says something and it's like try a white person saying something that they think somehow I don't know how really but like um that that's okay to say and um you know and of course the camera sees it very differently um and it's like a really painful moment you know and um and he gets corrected but does it even really land and I think I just knew I had to keep it in the film because it's such like one of those moments it's a real like for lack of a it's overused phrase but it's a teachable moment you know it's like Right. You know, you see that and you're like, oh, my God. Yeah, I mean, the other context to add is we were right near the rec site. I mean, we are, if, if not above it. And so it was right there. Yeah, it was Sorry. it was um, everyone was so raw emotionally. And so um, I always ha I hate saying this because, I, you know, when when a black person responds with grace to something that is offensive, it's sort of like, oh, I, I hate to put that burden. Kamau is the gentleman who said, you know, good master, bad master, still master in my mind. But, um, but, it, but it's true. I mean, he handled that with grace. Um, and I think, I, I think it, was a, it was about a lot of different things. Um, ha, I mean, a big part of it having to do with the fact that we, the proximity that we had to this horror and the way that the, the buttons that was pushing in all of us. Yeah. Another scene that struck me, it's, it's it has a sort of a different emotional color than that one, but the scene in the cemetery when there's the kind of the, 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 the white guy who's like a professor who says, oh yeah, I write Barracoon, it was like really sad. And the young guy's like, he's like, yeah, it used to make me cry, but you know, we're here. It doesn't make me sad anymore. I, that was such a powerful scene, I loved it. I mean, that guy, the, the descendant of Cujo was yeah, incredible. Yeah. He is, yeah, I mean, he's, he's so in command of, um, his emotional range, like he so knows himself, it's incredible. Um, yeah. He has so much maturity. And I think, you know, he was 27 when we shot that or something. It's incredible. When you, were in, when you were near him, he feels like royalty or something. I mean, he's just, he, there, there is a real magical quality about him. Like he is just literally channeling ancestors. I mean, it's, it's, pretty, yeah. it's pretty incredible. He's a leader, like through and through. Mm -hmm. And that guy again, it was like, it's like, oh, even he goes, oh, cool, cool. I was like, oh, really? <laughs> right. right. Um, I wanted to ask you about. There's a scene. Um, it's in the, the the kind of the big fancy uh, historical house, and um, it's a long shot where the person speaking is describing how the house makes him feel, and that like bad shit went down here. But yeah. the entire shot is is of water, mm -hmm. and it's his voice over the water. And I just wanted to talk, hear you talk about how how you came up with that. It's a really powerful moment in the film. Well, actually, that idea is um, my editor Mike's idea, um, and I had to really fight for that idea. Once he did it, I was like, "Yes, that's perfect." Um, but everyone was like, can't we see something? And I was like, no, like you should listen to what he's saying. And it's okay if it's a long moment. Um, and, and um, you know, but yeah, uh, that's the kind of things that, um, that everyone but the film team kind of wants to cut usually. Um, but I think it really allows you to listen to what he's saying and how it, how it struck him. And, um, and, and that was, to me, that was, once I saw it, I was like, yeah, that's what it has to be. But it wasn't my idea. Yeah. Wow. Amazing. Well, I'm glad it's in the film. It's an incredible yeah. film. And not that this is why it's powerful. It, it's like a gorgeous shot for one thing, just of the water. Yeah. And yeah. yeah, it forces you to listen. But then I found myself thinking about, oh, what's under the water? Like, what the yeah. Water? Well, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> it's, like, it's like, it's like, um, you know, I, I don't, I, I think like often people like are afraid to let the audience think, you know, and sit with, sit with the feeling. And I wanted people to sit with feelings and think, you know, and, and, and have mind wander in certain directions. Like I wasn't afraid of that. Like, I think the audience is smarter than oftentimes we give them, or I'm not going to say, I mean, I always want to respect my audience to, to like let their mind go where it goes. Yeah. Um, 
Well, the, the last thing I wanted to ask is just about, there's like, a, it's a major part of the film that we haven't talked about yet, but is all of the environmental stuff, like the present day issues, like people talking about, again, it's the community activism part of it, but all the people who have family members die of cancer or people in the film talking about, oh yeah, I had prostate. I, it's like the impact of the legacy of that history, how it's manifest now in the companies that control the space and pollute the space and are causing physical harm to the descendants of the Clotilda. It's, it's um, again, when you started the film, were you expecting that to end up being part of the story or was that something you found as you spent time there? Well, I mean, I, I growing up in Mobile, you know about that. Like, you know about like where the industrial stuff is. Like, I mean, I definitely knew where Africatown was situated. Um, that's not a secret. Um, I didn't know like the sort of the details. And I think a lot of that is still unfolding. Like where there's, there hasn't been a whole lot of money spent for environmental remediation in Africatown. That's a problem. So, I mean, a lot of that has to still be uncovered. Like the, the work is being done now. That's something that people can help with. Um, so yeah, I mean, Ramsey and Joe, like their, their lives are dedicated to that work. And, um, you know, we just hope when people see this film, they'll want to join, join them. Yeah. Right. Margaret always says this great thing. It's sort of like there, there was a moment when she, when she first visited Africa town and she smelled the chemicals, um, and, 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 and understood where this poison was meeting people and wanting to figure out how do I capture this in film? And I think, you know, turning points for social justice movements are often just turning a camera on an injustice. And so the hope is that, yeah, this film, like, you know, when you see it and you, you just, you can't believe at this, well, you can believe this is America. It's happening right. in a lot of black communities, but, um, but it's hard not to wanna do something when you see it. Yeah. To that point, could you talk a little bit about the release of the film? And so you're doing this, it's participant in higher ground. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious sort of, uh, you know, compared to Order of Myths or uh, your other films, is there a different approach to releasing the film and your hopes? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, when Order of Myths came out, it was it was a recession. It was 2008. And like, I, I hardly, you know, got any support for the, I mean, Cinema Guild, Cinema Guild did the best they could, but it was a tiny distributor. and. Um, and I mean, Netflix, so many people are gonna get to see this film and, and um, I'm so excited about it. Um, you know, Participant and Higher Ground are incredible partners. And obviously the Obamas, like the, they, they came and spoke before the film at um, the film festival in Martha's Vineyard. And they were so, it was incredible to have, you know, I mean, I think of myself as like fairly articulate, but when they introduce your film, you're like, oh, I'm not articulate. I can barely speak the ABCs. Like the way they spoke about it, I was just like, oh my God, like this is, you know, a dream. Like they're gonna inspire so many people to care about these issues that might, maybe might not. Um, and then, um, with participant, one reason I like to work with participant is they have a very robust impact side. So when the film ends and you're having your postpartum about like, what am I going to do? I care about this thing and it's done. The impact team comes on and, and a whole team of people who, who like work with the community to like further the goals of the movie. And we, I mean, Essie and I have been witnessing their work and it is like, sometimes I'm just like crying on the zoom, you know, it's, it's really what they're doing for the community and it's setting up something over a multi-year period. Um, they're, you know, they're, 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 it, the, the way they're amplifying what's already happening um, is really incredible. And, um, and I, so I feel like the work is just starting, you know, with the environmental work that what they're helping, like sort of um, the coalition building. I mean, again, with things that are already in place, but, um, but, you know, giving it to a wider audience. Amazing. Wow. That's great. Well, um, Margaret and Essie, thank you so much for, for taking time to talk with, with Film Independent today. And congrats on the film. It's so beautiful. Uh, everyone watching this Q&A has, well, initially will have seen the film, but if you haven't seen the film yet, please, please watch it when it's, when it's live. And um, thank you again both so much. Thank you, Josh. Thank you so much right. for having us. Yeah, of course. <laughs> thank you.